a message entitled, The Power of Your Will. Not the power of God's will, but the power of your will. And tonight I'm believing God for two things. Number one, I'm believing him to perform signs, wonders, and miracles. Do you believe he can do that tonight? I do believe the Bible says there were times where all of them were healed. And I've preached this message, as I said this morning, and seen it happen in my own life and ministry. And I believe that God can do it again tonight. I believe he can take every sickness and infirmity and bring cure to it tonight. Somebody ought to praise him in this place. So we're believing God to do that. And number two, I'm believing God to anoint your hands as instruments of healing. I want everybody to take your hands and put them out in front of you and look at the palm of your hands. And I want you to say this after me. God is about to anoint my hands as instruments of healing. Now the Lord instructed me this week to anoint every one of you with oil that would like to be anointed with oil for the healing anointing to come upon your life that God will use you because as great and marvelous as it will be to see God heal people in this place tonight, the real plan of God is to heal people in the marketplace. You never read occasions where people were healed in church. They were always healed on the streets or outside of the church, out in the marketplace and listen to me that's where we're going to flood this week we're going to flood this city with the anointing healing power of Jesus Christ God's going to use our hands as instruments of healing now you may remember in the Bible in Acts chapter 19 and verse number 11 where it says that God worked special, that word in the Greek means extraordinary. He worked extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. It doesn't mean that Paul was the healer or doing the healing. It meant that Paul was the vessel that the healing was flowing through and that flow was through the hands when he would lay his hands on the sick as the Bible instructed him to do and instructed you and I to do. That's the anointing we're going to believe God to place on every hand in this place that extraordinary miracles will begin to take place. It's time in the time we live in that people start coming up out of wheelchairs and blind start seeing again and the deaf start hearing. If he did it yesterday, he can do it today, praise God. Now, when speaking to the sick... Or let me say it this way, not just the sick, but also those who are called to bring the healing anointing to the sick, which happens to be every believer in this place. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been called to the healing ministry. It's not reserved for some preacher on TBN or for your pastor. If you, How many of you are believers tonight? You believe in Jesus Christ. Every one of you with your hands up, the Bible says you have been called to the healing ministry. Mark 16 verse 17 says, and these signs shall follow those who believe. Not follow preachers, not follow healing evangelists, but follow those who believe that you shall place your hands on the sick and the sick shall be healed. But here's my point. When speaking to the sick and those that are called to bring the healing anointing to the sick, all share the same question and that question is why do some not get healed? Why do we pray for some and they get healed and some don't? Why when I go out and lay hands on people, sometimes people are healed and sometimes they are not? Why don't some get healed? Well, let me say first off tonight I don't have the answer in full to that question but I will say this. I have some insight. I have some some revelation that really seems to be working, helping people get healed. And I've preached this message, as I said this morning, I've preached it many times. Crystal once told me we traveled as evangelists for about a year before we came here to Tag Church, and, uh, and I preached this every weekend. She could sit out there and just and, and quote the words. She knew, she knew what I was preaching. And one Sunday she said, what are you preaching? I said, the power of your will. She said, why don't you get something new, something fresh on healing. And of course she was kidding with me, but I said to her, I said, you got to 
to stick with what works. This message is working. This message is bringing revelation. This message is healing the sick. This message is producing miracles. Why am I going to preach something else when this one right here is working in churches and working in believers' lives? Glory to God. How many of you have ever questioned, why don't some get healed? I'm telling you, I've been to miracle services that when they're over, you see people coming out being pushed in their wheelchairs and other people coming out pushing their wheelchair. Why don't some get healed? I want everybody to turn to Genesis chapter number 11 tonight and we're going to begin to we're going to begin to see the Holy Spirit open this up to us here tonight. Genesis chapter number 11. Now, as you're turning there, I might say that you you may have never heard this text that we're about to read tonight used in a miracle or healing service. Matter of fact, unless you've heard this message I've preached, unless you got the CD, a past CD, or was in a past meeting, which I doubt, you have never, more than likely, never heard this text preached in regards to miracles and healing. And you're going to need to stay full. You're going to need to stay with me because we're going to start here. We're going to bring it around and eventually we'll get full circle and the light bulb will come on, I believe, if you'll stay with me as we try to bring this topic full circle. Genesis chapter number 11. And I want to begin reading in verse Number one, this is the story of the Tower of Babel. Most of you recall it. Let's look at a few verses together. The Bible says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and they had slime for mortar. Verse 4, and they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And let the, and and verse 5 says, and the Lord came down to see the city and to see the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one. Pay attention here. Verse Verse number number six, the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing, everybody say nothing. Nothing will be restrained from them. This is God speaking. Nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Everybody look up here at me. Close your Bible, sit them next to you, pay attention. We read in Genesis chapter 11 about a people who lived in a land called Shinar And they had determined in their minds, they had determined in their thinking, they had determined in their soulish realm, they had determined in their will, if you will, they had determined and they had willed, they had come up with an idea, an imagination, they had come up with this thought that we can build a tower that will reach heaven. And and this tower will represent our greatness. And, And what it will allow us to do is it will allow us to dominate and control the whole world and and even our own destiny apart from God. And this is the spirit that began to begin to possess, if you will, these people living in the land of Shinar. They begin to will in their minds that we can build a tower, we can be great, we can live apart from God through our own power, through our own unity, through our own great accomplishments, through our own technology. We're building a tower like no man had ever seen on the face of the earth before will be greater than any other people. People will come to us. They will desire our knowledge and our expertise and everything that we've imagined and been able to take that thought, take that process of thinking and create something with it. The Bible says here that they desired to build a tower that would reach heaven. Listen to me today. Their free will was so saturated in pride. They had this spirit about them that said, we can do 
do this. We, we can accomplish this. I want you to know something tonight. From Satan falling out of heaven because of a pride issue all the way to the year 2015, from Genesis to Revelation, pride continues to be a secret enemy which tries to invade our minds and tries to invade our thinking and tries to invade our churches. It tries to invade your mind for one purpose, to cause you to begin to focus on your own self and your own abilities rather than the abilities of God and what God wants to do in your life. I'm telling you, you can read stories of man after man in this Bible who once they became prideful, they saw destruction in their life. Why? The Bible says that pride cometh before destruction. Kings who thought they were great and great kings and building great kingdoms. It was in their greatness and in their pride that they were brought down. Listen to me today. There are people living in the land today right here in 2015 that want to live according to their own ways. They say things like this. I can make it. I got this. I can handle this. No big deal. It's an issue of pride where they don't ask for help. They don't pray. They don't seek God. They don't ask God to heal them. They don't ask God to help them. They just say, you know what? I can make it. A little pill here, a little pill there. It'll be okay. I'll be able to live. A little test and a little hospital hospital stay and, and I'll be okay. Listen to me tonight. Pride will cause you to be self-centered and eventually pride can cost you your life. Is anybody in this place tonight? Pride is the reason a lot of people stay lost. I don't need God. I don't need somebody to govern my life. I don't need your God. I don't need your religion. I'm doing just fine. Everything is okay. I don't need a God to be in control of my life. Pride's the reason a lot of people stay lost. Pride's the reason a lot of your family members aren't serving Jesus today. I'm telling you, it's not just sin and being lost in sin. It's pride. It's pride. I don't need a God in my life. Now, here's what we're going to try to bring full circle tonight. Pride is also the reason a lot of people in the church stay sick. Just like a lot of people in the world stay lost because of pride, a lot of people in the church stay sick because of their pride. The Bible says it this way in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. God resists the proud. Everybody shout, resists. Yes. But he gives grace. Say, gives grace. To the humble. Listen to that. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. What God is saying here is those that are prideful, those that in their own will, in their own imagination, have decided, I've got this. I don't need God's help. God cannot do anything for that person. God isn't going to force himself on somebody. I'm telling you, when I give an altar call here in a moment, there will be people who will choose to stay at their seat thinking, I'm okay with this sickness, and God won't heal you there. He can't do a thing for you, friend. Why? He resists the proud, but what, what's the opposite? He gives grace to the humble. When we, come into, we, when we come to God with a spirit of humility that says, you know what, God? I don't want to live with this. I can't keep going on. I need you, oh God. I need your healing. I need your miracle. I need your touch in my life. The Bible says that kind of spirit, God gives grace to. Hallelujah. The next verse, verse Six. Remember, context, context, context. Verse 6 of 1 Peter 5. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you. Now, I love this. The next verse, verse 7, is the one we like to take out of context. Not many people go around memorizing 1 Peter 5, verse 5. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's not one you hang up on your bathroom mirror to memorize. That's not one you're feeding your spirit. Matter of fact, I bet very few people knew it was located where it's located. But verse number 7, people quote this one all the time. They pull it right out of that chapter. They don't look at the verse before it or the verse behind it. They just pull verse 7 out, just like the verse I preached a few weeks ago. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Man, we use that thing out of context all the stinking time, glory to God. It's speaking about contentment, not being able to go out and do anything you want to do, glory to God. I'm telling you, we do the same thing with verse 7 right here. When I read it, you're going to know. You're going to say, yep, that's right, we do. We, we, we like that one. Verse 7, cast all your cares 
upon him. How many of you have heard that before? Cast all, we love that one. Cast all your cares upon him, verse 7. But we don't put it in the context. Listen, the context is pride never casts their cares on the Lord. Pride keeps you from giving stuff to God. But when you come to God in humility, then you're able to do, verse 7, and cast all your care upon him. Cast your sickness. Cast your depression. Cast your oppression. Cast your bondages. Cast your problems on them and let them take care of you. Y'all are the quietest crowd I've ever preached this message to. Come on, listen to me. Come on, talk to me. Come on, come on, talk to me. Come on, wake up, talk to me. Talk to me. Engage this with me. Come on, I'm waiting. I'm not going on until you start talking. Hallelujah, come on. Come on, come on, wake up somebody. Wake up somebody. Wake up somebody. Because there's a prideful spirit. There's a prideful spirit. I'm telling you, I, I wish I could reveal some things the Lord showed me when I come to this church and some of the past with the previous pastor who was sick and a plague of sickness that touched this church. I'm telling you, there's pride that keeps people from their miracles. You got to be careful of this. You better listen to this tonight. We live in a different time. This is what I mean about your free will. And we'll get back to the people at Shinar in just a moment. We live in a different period of time. Let me give you an example here. If I was to advertise like I did this morning in the 1950s, if we could go back to the 1950s and advertise that we're having a miracle service at 11120 Cantrell Road. Now listen, in the 50s they didn't have the miracle services in air conditioned buildings like we're sitting in tonight. They set up big tents. And I ain't got the time to go into all the great tent meetings. Many of you remember the great tent healing revivalists of that time. But, the, but, but, but history tells us some of them tents held 10, 15,000 people. I'm telling you, 15,000 people tents that people would come and pack themselves into in the great healing meetings of the 50s. People would come for miles. People would drive for hours just because there was a miracle service in a certain town at a certain time for a certain period of time, several days, whatever, and people would begin to come. Why? Because in the 1950s, a lot of people didn't have the money to go down and see the doctor or get hooked up onto a machine or have the money, money to be on prescription medication every day. A lot of people didn't have what you and I have, a doctor's office on every corner or, 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 or technology to help us. I'm telling you, they built that tower. They built their technology up. They built, we can do this on our own, God. If I was to preach a message like this about 60 years ago or advertise a miracle service, you couldn't get all the people into this place. Why? Because a different period of time, people depended on God for miracles. They depended on God for healing. They didn't run to the bank to get a financial loan. They said, God, we need you to come through for us. We need it to rain. We need our crops to grow. God, we need you. They had prayer meetings in their home. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, they didn't have Benadryl on their shelves. They didn't have Walgreens on the corner. When little, when little Faith got sick and she's running 104 degree fever, mama didn't run down getting her BMW and go down to Walgreens and get a, and she don't have a BMW, but uh, maybe I'm speaking prophetically there, but you know, let me, let me get this right. He receives it, but she didn't get in her minivan and go down to Walgreens and buy Tylenol and Benadryl, and the doctor said in the ER, he said, just switch back and forth, four hours, give her Benadryl, then four hours, she didn't have that. You know what they did? They laid hands on little Faith, and they said, God, we need you to heal our little girl. She's hurting, and she's in pain. We need you, God. But we don't do that anymore. It's the power of your will. The will of man today says run off and let man help man. Let, let's, find a, uh, let's find a quick fix to help man. It's a different period of time. And that's why if we set up a tent today, I don't care if we produce 50,000 fires and mailed them out and passed them out. If we set up a tent out in that lot and passed out 50,000 flyers besides us that are here tonight, there might be three or four that would show up to a miracle service. Why? People don't need miracles today because they got their own power. They're building their own tower. They're looking around saying, look at what we've done for ourselves. People don't come to church today 
way because they believe they don't need God. Their will says, I don't need a God. I wish y'all would help me tonight. Woo, glory to God. So that's why James chapter 4 verse 6 says, God resists. Say resists. He resists the proud, but he gives grace. Sound familiar? James saying the same thing Peter's saying. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He goes on to say, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee, to you, flee from you. Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. You want to see miracles tonight? You want to see God touch you? You got to do this right here. You got to get to a place where you say, God, only you are my answer. I'm telling you, we can learn from Scripture that God created us with a free will. It's written all over the pages. Free will, free will, free will. The Bible talks more about the free will of man than it does the will of God. It's your free will to trust God for salvation and be saved. It's your will. God isn't forcing salvation on any one of you. That's why this morning I stood right here. I stood right here with a candle in my hand. And I said, if anybody needs to be born again, come, come. I didn't come to, I didn't come to somebody. There were several. There was at least five or six that needed to come to that candle. Hear me tonight. There was. Then there's one after it's over that chased me down back behind the stage. You wanted to do it back in secret. Wanted to do it in hiding. I'm telling you, I can't force you to come to the light. It's your free will to come to God. It's your free will to be saved. Free will is so important. And it's also your free will to trust God for a miracle when you're sick. It's your free will to believe that God can heal you because He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it's also your free will to expect to die. Why do some get healed, some don't? I cannot help anybody that says, well, I've lived a good life. I guess I'll just die. That's your will. You've made up your mind. I can't help you. Well, you know, getting older, we start losing our hearing anyhow. So I'll just, these hearing aids are working. That's your will. That's your will. I cannot help you from that point forward. Now, I preached this in the, in, the, in, the, in the meeting where everybody got healed. We had about 10 people that had hearing aids laying across the altars because people got their will lined up with the will of God. And they, one guy told me, he said, I may be 89 years old and hard of hearing, but I believe what you preach tonight. I'm taking these things out. We stuck my fingers in his ears. And before he left that place, he gave them to me. He said, here, keep these. Take them to the place you go preach next week and show people that God can still heal people. He can still heal people. You got to make up your mind, though. Some of you are building a tower. You're building a tower. And your strength is in what your hands have done. I'm telling you, if I took this same message and preached it in a third world country where they didn't have Baptist Hospital and St. Vincent and everything else right at their fingertips, you couldn't keep people from coming running, receiving this. But this ain't a message for a third world country. This is a message for America. This is a, Mer this is a message for the prideful American church that has gone on doing it without God. Woo, preacher, preach to us, somebody say. Preacher, preach to us. See, it's your free will to cast your burdens upon him or to keep them. He's not going to force you to give them. It's your free will to depend upon yourself and live without his help, if that's your choice tonight. So in God's, in God's real unique plan of creation in designing you and I, as a threefold being, spirit, soul, and body. He's designed, listen to me, he's designed us to be able to do anything in our will. Amen. What did our opening text say? God looked at him and said, there is nothing they cannot do. God said that. He said that about their free will, about their imagination. There's nothing they cannot do. He's designed you and me with an ability to do anything in our will. He's designed you with a force. Everybody say a force. And that force, he's allowed to be stronger than all of the force of heaven put together called the will of God. 
The will of man, he is allowed to be stronger than the force of of his will and the force of heaven. I'm preaching tonight about the strongest force of man. It's the power or the force of the will. Think about this. The God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who in six days spoke this world that we live in into existence and on the seventh day rested. The God who the Bible says uses the earth as his footstool. Are y'all here tonight? The Bible who says his throne is heaven and the earth is his footstool. He respects your will. The God who holds earth in the palm of his hand and the little speck that you and I are on there. He respects the will within that speck. He will never, 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 never violate your will. It's his design. It's his plan. He will never violate your will. You know how powerful your will is? Your will is so powerful that it can send you to hell when God's will is for you to go to heaven. Hello? He is willing, the Bible says, will of God, that no man perish, but every man come unto repentance. Amen. Amen. He is willing that no man perish. No man go to hell. But I'm telling you, more going to hell than heaven. That's what the Bible says. Broads the path that leads to destruction. Narrows the path that leads to life. The will of God, the power of your will is so powerful that when the people of Shinar began to build this tower of Babel, a meeting in heaven was called about it. And God and God said in verse 6, he looked at the Trinity. He looked at the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says in our text there, I think verse 7 even says us. In other words, just like when he created the earth, let us make man in our image. He spoke to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Trinity, let us make man in our Trinity. Plural, our image. Same thing with this meeting that was called in heaven. God goes down and he sees this city and this tower they're building. And, and, he, and that word us comes again, that plural, the trinity. In other words, they have a meeting. God talks to the Son about this and he talks to the Holy Spirit about it. And he looks at them in this meeting and he says to them, we've got to stop this construction. we got to go down and stop it because there's nothing they plan to do that will be impossible for them. Now everybody look up here at me. Most people that I meet in the altars that need a miracle, they have this theology. You know, people have weird thoughts about God. Have you, have you recognized that? And, and I, we get all these thoughts. I don't know where we get them all. I, I've seen... Ch- People that maybe had an absent father grow up thinking God's absent in their life. Or a mean father, they grow up thinking God's mean. I, I don't know where we get all our thoughts about God. I can watch TBN and figure out people have thoughts about God that he's the fairy godmother, just ready to cha-ching his wand, give you a million bucks for sending a thousand dollar seed, hallelujah. I don't know where they get these thoughts. Anybody on Facebook? People put out there, share this and God will bless you a hundredfold. Man, I shared that for two years, nothing happened. No. People got warped theology. And it keeps them from getting healed. Do you know what most assembly of God's people theology of God is when it comes to healing and miracles? This is weird. It's warped. But let me explain it. How many of you remember Ed McMahon? Publisher's Clearing House. Me remember on TV, Ed McMahon shows up in the minivan at your front door. Those of you that don't know Ed McMahon, just stay with me. You'll figure him out in a minute. (laughs) 
Ed McMahon was the one everybody wanted to show up at their house. Primetime television would have, would have a two-hour segment on a Friday night showing, showing the publisher's clearinghouse, sweepstakes, whatever it was called, pulling up into people's houses. They always pulled up in a white minivan. And they got out and they had balloons to glory and a big bouquet of flowers. And it took two men to carry the big cardboard check that said $10 million. And they knock on that front door because that dear old lady had been sending in her magazine stamps. Been sticking those stamps, sending it in. Sticking those stamps on them. Sticking, sticking, I'm going to win. I'm just, I believe, I believe, I believe God. Ed McMahon's coming to my house. Oh, hallelujah. Stick them on, send it in. Stick it on, send it out. Sick, bop, 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 bop. And finally, and it's always this lady, she just woke up, still got her robe on, hair all messed up, sleep in her eyes. She opens the door and she sees the big group of people and the cameras and the flowers and the balloons and ultimately right there the big cardboard check that has her name on it with ten million dollars and then she starts going berserk she starts screaming and waving her hands running in we just won the publisher's clearinghouse come on kids and, and they give her the flowers and the balloons and she's about to faint and they hand her the cardboard check and everything and Ed McMahon comes on and he says you can be next you can be next just mail in your stamped envelope glory to God and we'll come to your house you're going to win it next time and I have prayed with people in the altars that have a mentality that God is Ed McMahon. Preacher, what in the world do you mean? People used to live, man, I hope someday I'll win that sweepstakes. I hope someday I could win that $10 million. It would change my life. Someday. I hope that white van and those balloons and those flowers and that big check shows up in my yard. And people begin to have this mentality in the church of Ed McMahon where they start saying, you know, if I just, if I just stay in the Word and if I'm just faithful and if I just keep praying and if I just, if I just keep coming to church and if I just keep enduring and if I just, if, I just, if I just keep loving God and doing what's right and keep sending Him a tithe and keep, keep, keep obeying the Lord, if I just keep doing what I'm supposed to do, then just maybe someday God will show up for me like Ed McMahon showed up for them and heal my diabetes or heal my cancer or take my disease away. Hopefully, maybe someday. I grew up singing, everybody will be happy over there. That's Ed McMahon theology. Some glad morning, everybody's going to be happy over there. I've dealt with the will of man that have said, well, if God doesn't heal me, that's okay. I know he'll heal me over there. Well, you're right. You just made up your mind. You're getting healed over there. Everybody will be happy, will be happy over there. We will shout and sing God's praise. Everybody will be happy over there. You know what they're really singing? Nobody is happy here, happy here, happy here. We will frown and die in our sickness. Everybody will be sad over here. Everybody's broke over here, sick over here, migraines over here. But if I stay in the Word, the white van will pull up. I'll make it in the rapture, and I'll be healed forevermore. Everybody will be happy over there. Yes. Woo! Glory to God. <laughs> but don't expect me to be happy here. And that's the reason we sang it, because nobody was happy over here. <laughs> if you don't believe me, listen to an Assembly of God prayer request service. That's why I don't do them. Listen to an Assembly of God prayer request service. My lands, you'd think, golly, it'd be a crowd of 17 in a Wednesday night prayer meeting. <laughs> in a Wednesday night Bible study and prayer requests will go for 30 minutes 
I mean, if I was a non-follower of Jesus and just happened to attend that night and sat in an Assembly of God prayer service, I'd think I am not joining these people. They have got way too many problems. I mean, they're praying for their aunt, sister's first cousin's big toe. They're all unhappy. They're all attacked. Pastor, pray for me. The devil's been after me all week. Ain't nobody happy. Everybody's going through something. But over there, it'll all get fixed. We've been guilty, Assembly of God, of not letting God do His miracle work and power today because over there, everybody's going to get fixed. Someday when we get over there, Someday, if I'm lucky, like Ed McMahon, someday when everything's going to get fixed, my ears will get fixed when I get over there. <laughs> my eyes will be fixed when I get over there. My knees will be fixed. My blood sugar will be fixed. My arthritis will be fixed. Hello now. My kidney stones will be gone. My migraine headaches won't be there anymore. My shoulder pain won't be hurting me anymore. My throat won't be sore anymore when I get over there. But I guess I'll just endure today. Well, you've made up your will, haven't you? You've decided what's going to happen. So we used to also sing when we all get to heaven. And those were good songs to just clap along with, but the theology in them are horrible. People have asked me, why don't you sing some of the old hymns? And I love a lot of them, but there's a lot of them. Their theology is messed up. They are <laughs> messed up, man. But you know, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We'll sing and shout the victory. <laughs> but we ain't got the victory today, so we'll have to wait till we get to heaven. Are y'all hearing me tonight? Not going to do it over here. Not going to do it over here. We'll just mope around and moan and talk about how big our problems is rather than how big our God is. I deal with this in nearly every healing service and prayer for healing. This theology that people believe someday, everybody say someday, because we guilty Pentecostal, someday I'll be healed. But very few come expecting to be healed today. Someday, but very few today. If it wasn't the case, this place would be packed tonight. And all the sick people that were here this morning would be here tonight. They'd be here tonight. Those that got a migraine headache this afternoon would have been here tonight. It's a different time. But we'll pop a couple pills and wait for heaven. Oh, this is tough, isn't it? Y'all don't want to hear this, do you? You can live in this stage of hoping all you want, but I've come tonight to ask you, is today the day of victory? Is today the day of miracles? Is today the day of signs and wonders? Can God do it today? Woo! Man, y'all getting me excited now. Yeah, you're getting me excited now. You act like you believe it. <laughs> My, hallelujah. Woo, glory to God. Turn to your neighbor and say, is now the time? See, you must move from the realm of someday, somehow, some way, and enter the now. What about the now? Can God do it now? I want you to know that healing power is available 24-7, 365 days a year. I want you to know that Jesus wasn't... Listen, it's not that Jesus was the healer. It's not that Jesus will be the healer. I want you to know tonight that Jesus is the healer. He's not running for re-election. He doesn't need an act of Congress to heal you. 
He doesn't need the Supreme Court to help you get a miracle tonight. Uh -huh. Woo, glory to God. He's still on the throne. He's still doing it today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. <laughs> Healing power is available all the time. Like the Walmart Super Center, open all the time. Uh, whoo, yeah, it's available all the time. It's available right now. This is how you can have a service where everybody gets healed in because they start believing what you're saying. The Word produces faith, the Bible says. All of a sudden, I told you it's not deep, it's simple. Somebody's sitting there thinking, you know what? I've lived with this for so many years. I've never really thought that God could heal it. Now I've thought about it. They choose to believe God. What they're doing is they choose to line their will up with the will of God. And when that comes together, friend, miracles happen and healings take place. Oh, glory to God. Oh, my. Well, glory to God. Shatana mama masi You don't need to go to a healing crusade. Well, if I could just travel to Phoenix where Benny Hinn's going to be in a crusade next weekend, I could probably be healed. Uh, ooh. I, the anointing is so strong. I, I wasn't going to tell you all this, but I am going to tell it to you now. When I was sitting, I sat down during worship. Somebody grabbed my right arm. I looked over to see what Haven wanted, and she wasn't there. There was a hand grabbing my right arm. <laughs> I'm I wasn't going to tell you because that may mess some of you up. But the Lord grabbed my right arm tonight during worship. And I knew from that moment forward, God's going to do something. in He's going to do something in this place. You just got to get your will right. You just got to get your will in play. Woo! Oh, Lord. That's how it's possible. You just start believing what he said. It's not that hard. Every child in this place ought to be able to do it. Everybody ought to be able to do it. Well, if we could just get to that crusade so the man in the white suit could breathe on us. <sighs> now, I'm not discounting the man in the white suit because I've been to many of his crusades and my wife has interpreted for Benny Hinn mainly because it got us good seats. <laughs> We've actually sat in that section with Arlene before we even knew Arlene years ago. And I watched on Thursday night deaf people all around me not able to hear and my wife interpret. And I watched them Friday morning in the anointing service not be able to hear as my wife interprets. And then I watched them on Friday night in miracle service when in the middle of worship, all of a sudden they grabbed their ears and started screaming because it was so loud. I watched their ears open in the meetings. But I'm telling you, Healing power is available right now, right here. People talk about, well, you got to get the atmosphere right for healings. You got to get a healing anointing and a healing atmosphere. You got to sing, How Great Thou Art. And the organ's got to go to a key that it's never gone. And the choir's got to sing angelic. Glory to God. And there's got to be this force come into the place. And then healings can start taking place. If a man can get saved in a bar, then surely the same Jesus who walked into an alcoholic's bar room can walk into your situation tonight. If the same power can heal you in an atmosphere that's not very godly, then surely he can heal you in an atmosphere. The word works, I don't care the atmosphere. 
I said the word works. I don't care the atmosphere. That's why healings take place in marketplaces. That's why they take place at the supermarket. That's why they take place in the break room at work. They take place anywhere you go and lay your hands on people. I had someone tell me once, they said, why don't we see miracles like we used to? I said, how many, hands, how many people have you laid your hands on and prayed for one? What do you mean you don't see miracles? I see them all the time. Come hang around with me for a while. If you just do what he said to do, you'll see them. It's not that hard. You don't have to travel across the country. But this happens. People blame the lack of miracles on atmosphere. People can get saved anywhere. They can get healed anywhere. I mean, the bar is not the most anointed place in the world. But there's people getting saved in the bars. Because Jesus will walk in them. And if they can get saved in bars and get healed anywhere. That's free. Turn to your neighbor and say, that didn't cost a thing. One of my favorite verses of all time, Jesus Christ, I've already said it tonight, is the same. Did you hear that? The same. Yesterday, today, and forever. That means the same Jesus. <laughs> who walked the streets of Galilee 2,000 years ago. The same Jesus who went up to the blind, spit in the, spit in the dirt, made mud, wiping it on his eyes, causing him to have sight. The same Jesus who told his friend Lazarus to come up out of that grave. The same Jesus who caused the lame to walk is the same today as he was 2,000 years ago. Most of us believe the yesterday and the forever we get hung up on the today. We believe the miracles of the Bible and we believe we'll all be healed when we get to heaven. We get hung up on the today. The power of of your will. <clears throat> He's healer. He is the miracle worker. Do you believe that today? Yes. Do you want it today? Yes. Do you want to get healed or stay sick? Yes. Do you want to be used of God or not used of God? Yes. Do you want to be free or do you want to stay bound? Glory to God. Yes. Do you want to be blessed or you want to stay broke? Yes. Do you want to be revived or you want to stay dead? What's your will? Do you see how the power of the will works in your life? God wants, God wills for every one of you to be healed. God wills for you to be blessed. It's his will for you to be free. God wills for you to be revived. But as I've said, God will not violate your will, the power of your will. I'll never forget a few years ago praying for a pastor in Mexico. The pastor was in a wheelchair. He had been hit by a car. I may have told this story before. But he, he had been hit by a car, and he was in a wheelchair, paralyzed, waist down. It was a sad story, real sad. In Mexico, in the church, you have to be full-time. You can't pastor and work a secular job. So a lot of times, the wife will be the pastor, so the husband can go work. You see, he can go make the living because there's no offerings in Mexico churches. I'm telling you, the offerings on Sunday are cents, not dimes, not, not quarters. They're pennies in Mexican money. It, there's no offering in the places we go down into Mexico, okay? There's, it's just not there. And, and, and so in this case, the pastor was in a wheelchair. He couldn't work. So he was called to be the pastor of this church. Neither him or his wife worked. They lived off the offerings of the church. It was a sad, sad thing. He's in a wheelchair. His wife would pick him up when they would leave to put him in the car. She'd pick up his whole body. And he was, he was he, 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 you know, he kind of looked like Alex. Uh, I'm just kidding, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, his wife had to pick him up and sit him in the car to go home. Felt so sorry. This car just, oh. The car was horrible. And thank God for our missions team. We bought him a car before we left. We bought that family a car. All the guys got together and said, what can you give? Let's buy him a car. And, and those of you that go, you know we have an awesome team. They, they, they have a heart for these needs. But we prayed for that pastor. 
several times that week. It was on the last day we were praying for him. And I felt led to get down at his feet and I knelt down at his, I knelt down there at his feet right in front of him. And I literally laid, I laid in his lap, literally put my head down in his lap as I was holding him, weeping. God had given me such a burden and compassion for him. I was so broken for him and believed that God could heal him. I knew that before we left that day, he was going to be walking. I, I, I knew it. I believed it. And I was just weeping for God, pastor to another pastor, heartbroken for him. And I'm just weeping before him, paralyzed, waist down, cannot move from the waist down. And all of a sudden, people are surrounding him. Other people are kneeling around him. And all of a sudden, as I'm laying in his lap, I feel his legs start coming up and down, like vibrating like this. Let me sit down so I can show you. He's sitting in the wheelchair, and they're like this. They're literally, they're literally, literally moving up and down. My body's shaking. I jumped up to my feet real quick. Everybody started shouting. Everybody, they, they start, his wife weeping now. She's seeing his legs moving like that. Everybody's crying, shouting, laughing, glory, praise. And God seeing his legs. He looks down at his legs and he goes, and his eyes got that big, and immediately he grabbed the side of his wheelchair. And I kid you not, when his hands grabbed the wheelchair, power of God left just like that, and the legs stopped. The power of your will. I'll never forget, you all know Smith Wigglesworth, Raise the Dead, Many Miracles. Never forget the story of Smith Wigglesworth. He had been called one night after a, preaching a service to a lady's house who was bound to a wheelchair. Had been bound to a wheelchair, could not walk. He had been called to her, church, to her house and several from the church went with him. And this, this guy had seen countless miracles and the dead being raised. I'm telling you, powerful things. He was the puncher healing evangelist. If you had cancer, he wanted to know where it was, and he punched you in that place. If you had cancer of the stomach, he punched you. I don't, I'm not talking laid hands. Punched you. One night, a lady with cancer, he punched her so hard in the stomach. Back in that day, platforms were real tall. They weren't like this. They were tall, like the old, old churches, real tall. He punched her. She fell off, and she died when she hit the floor. Most, if you've read any of his books, you've read that story. It's in most of them. She hit the floor. She died. You know what he did? He came down. He raised her from the dead. Anybody like to walk in that kind of power? Yeah. Every one of you can. Smith was a plumber. Smith Wigglesworth was a plumber. He, did, he was a plumber. Any plumbers in this place? Raise your hand so I know who to call when we got problems around here. Anybody want to be a plumber? Nobody here want to be a plumber? Huh. A plumber, I mean, that's not the dream job. My girls aren't like, Dad, when I grow up, I want to be a plumber. <laughs> nobody grows up wanting to be a plumber. Some become plumbers, but nobody wants to be a plumber. Smith was a plumber. And he believed what this Bible said, and he lined his will up with God's will. And he saw mighty, mighty miracles. Crazy. Remember our opening? Remember Acts 19, 11? Extraordinary miracles. He was sent to this lady's house. She's in a wheelchair. He commands her to be healed in Jesus' name. She actually floats up out of the wheelchair. She literally, her body, come up out of the wheelchair. Not way up, come up out of the wheelchair. She is suspended in the air. Chair right underneath her, she's floating. Once again, hallelujah, praise God. Now sister, walk. She looked down. She saw herself suspended. She grabbed her wheelchair. I shared this story with your mom in the hospital the other day. And when she grabbed the chair, she fell into it. And here's what he said. He said, ma'am, you'll never come out of this wheelchair, will you? And she said this, I will go to the grave in this wheelchair. Listen to her statement. I will. And he said this. The book said, he said, there's nothing I can do for you. And he left. 
Now, you know what we'd be doing in our Assembly of God churches? Every service, we'd be pulling her up, anointing her with oil, getting around her, laying hands, God, please heal her, touch her, we believe you can. He can't violate the will. No, those are tough stories. But this is why a lot of people don't get healed. Because of their will. Because of their will. Do you see the power of the will tonight? I was preaching a service a couple years ago. A lady pulled her hearing aids out. We laid them on the altar. We prayed. We tested. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Step back a little further. Say, praise God. Praise God. Woman, could you hear like this when you come into this place? No. She's crying, praising God. Church starts praising the Lord. No doubt she was healed. Elderly woman healed. Hearing aids out. Able to hear. Hear better than most people that didn't even think they had hearing problems. Totally healed. Goes back to her seat, sits down. Service is over. I'm down standing over, over here on the side. People are coming up. Thank you for the word. Praise God. God bless you. Good to see you. Huh. And I watched her come up. She walked over the altar. She grabbed her hearing aids. She walked over to me. She said, I may need these in the morning. Power of your will. No, ma'am, you need to go ahead and put them in right now. You need to just go ahead and put them in right now. The power of the will. There's no greater force of statement that you can make than I will. Woman looked at Smith and what'd she say? I will go to the grave with this condition. God cannot and will not overcome you saying, I will. Isn't that something? No matter how much oil you pour on that poor lady. It would do no good. You're wasting your breath until she changes her will. I know this is tough. But somebody's going to change their will tonight. Somebody's going to change their will in this place tonight. I'm not impressed with your little scripture quoting. I want to know what your will is. I don't care if you know every healing verse in the Bible. Because us, us Pentecostals, remember, we're guilty of the someday God's going to do it, Ed McMahon. Then you got the word of faith. You know what I'm talking about. Daddy Hagen, you know, Rhema. Sorry, Colin, she's a Rhema graduate. But you know, the word of faith people go around quoting scriptures and, you know, not confessing their sickness. They got a picture of Kenneth Hagen hanging up in their front living room, whatever. You know. I'm not impressed with your scripture quoting. I want to know what your will is. I don't care if you can give me every Old Testament, New Testament verse on healing in Greek and say it backwards. I want to know, standing at this altar, what is your will? That's what I want to know. Can you handle this service tonight? It's different, is it? But you'd be amazed at how people think. And you have to preach stuff like this to get in their will. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, what? So is he. As a man thinketh, your will, think what you've imagined. The people of Shinar, they imagine in their minds what you think, what a man thinketh, so is he. I want everybody to look here and listen. Everything that happens to you is decided between this ear and this ear. That little bit of space right there. Everything that happens to you is produced between this ear and that ear. Every decision, every thought, every choice you make is right there. And the reason some can't be healed is because they don't think they will be. It's Ed McMahon. It'd be nice if I won the sweepstakes, but probably not. It'd be nice if God healed me, but probably won't happen. The greatest hindrance to your faith is your will. Now I'm going to say a statement here. And if you, if you have a hard time with it, I want you to look at your will versus God's will. 
It is God's will. It is God's will for you to be healed and delivered every time, every way. To not believe that is to not believe in the wonder-working power that Jesus Christ paid for at Calvary. To believe that sickness came from God, you don't understand it. None of it came from God. God didn't put it on you to teach you something. It all is from the fall. It's all from the enemy. Are y'all hearing me tonight? You have to line your will up with God's will. It's his will to heal you. People think their will doesn't count. All we've ever heard in church is God's will, God's will, God's will. Well, if it's God's will, if it's God's will, it'll happen. Well, just whatever God wants to do. Well, I'm here to tell you he wants to heal you. He sent a son and took stripes upon his back for your healing tonight. You got to preach stuff like this to get inside of people's will. Because people are fighting to stay sick, broke, and depressed. They are. People, people want to stay that way. You got to preach stuff like this to get into their wills. Get them to think differently. It's time to get out of our will and into God's will. Well, pastor, but I'm getting old. Okay. And pastor, with age goes health and stuff. Oh, oh really? Can you show me that? In the book, the good book. My prayer for those that are elderly and sick is this, God. If you still have them here, you have them here for a reason. And I'm asking you to give them healing, strength, and refreshment to accomplish what you've called them to do. Now, amen, glory. Give glory to God. I know we're all going to die. But I don't necessarily believe we'll all die of something unless we will to be. Well, I've just learned to live with it. I love this one. You know, it could be worse. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I'm okay. It could, could be worse. Okay. My, the, the most famous one of all that just causes me to... Ugh. If God wants me healed, He can heal me. He does want you healed. You can know that tonight. <laughs> because Jesus is the will of God in action. And Jesus walked every day of His life healing people. Jesus, you didn't hear me, is the will of God in action. You want to know the will of God? Look at Jesus. I'm going to close tonight with this passage in John 5. I'm going to close with this right here. John chapter 5. How many of you are ready tonight? How many of you are ready for God to touch you tonight? How many of you are ready for God to use you tonight? Hallelujah. John chapter 5. You can turn there if you'd like. Most of you know the story of the man at the pool of Bethesda. John chapter 5 and verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool. That should be translated a gate, like a sheep gate. Which is also called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. Having five, five porches. It's almost like a public infirmary is what's happening here. Outside, public, five porches, meaning five houses, if you will, of grace and mercy. Verse 3, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, withered, halt. Look at this, waiting for the moving of the water. They're laying around waiting for the moving of the water. Verse 4, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool, troubled the water. This wasn't folklore, this was a fact given to John. That whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Pretty simple. Angel stirred the water. First person in, 
was healed of any disease they had. Verse 5, don't miss this one. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. This man has been laying by this pool with an infirmity for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lie, he knew that he'd been now a long time in that case. He knew he had been a long time in that case. 38 years. And he said unto them, Will thou be made whole? What he said, he didn't say, I will. Will you? What he was asking the man who 38 years had been laying by this pool is, what's your will? You've been laying here 38 years, you ain't ever got into the water. What do you want? You've been on that blood sugar medicine 38 years, what's your will? You want to stay on it or you want to be healed? What do thou will? What's your will? Jesus dealt with the power of the man's will because he had excuses. And you can't read this in the Bible, but I can almost hear the man saying, you know, but Jesus, I tried to get in and somebody cut in front of me. Jesus, I tried. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. No, no, no. What do you will, sir? And then he spoke to him. And he said, rise up. In other words, the man we must have said, I want to be healed, Jesus. So Jesus said, rise up, take up your mat and walk. And you know what else it says? It says immediately the man was healed. Immediately the power of God come into him and healed him. And Jesus feels no compassion for this man because he tells man been laying there 38 years, get up, get your bed and go. Man's been laying there 38 years, tell him to get his own bed. We're not talking a little mat like a trifold kindergarten mat. He got a bed he's been laying on. Jesus said, get up, get your bed and go. What do thou will? I want to be healed. Well, get up then, get your bed and go. Jesus just told a man who'd been laying there 38 years to pick up his bed and go. Right. He spoke to his will. I'm about to speak to your will tonight. Pastor Mike, would you come? I want to speak into someone's will in this place tonight. I want to speak into someone's spirit tonight and say, take up your mat and walk, glory to God. I, I want to speak to someone and say, rise up and be healed in the name of Jesus. Rise up and be made whole in your body tonight. He told a paralyzed man to get up. I just, I wish we could hear the words of the Lord telling us to get up today. Get up today. I'm not a preacher that tells people that they should get off their medicine until they've been whole, made whole. But I believe if we do it the way Jesus did it, he would say, rise up. Rise up and take up your mat and walk. Rise up, be delivered of medication, and be made whole in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And then carry your bed. That's your testimony. Carry it with you. Tell the world what I did for you. Jesus asked him, and he's asking us tonight, do you want me to heal you? That's really what he asked. Do you want me to heal you? Your health isn't your problem. Your doctor isn't your problem. Your medication's not your problem. Your kidneys are not your problem. Your lungs are not your problem. Your arthritis is not your problem. Your cancer is not your problem. Your hearing loss is not your problem. Your blood sugar is not your problem. Your heart, it's not your problem. Your arthritis is not your problem. Your money, is not your problem. Your mind is not your problem. Your problem is your will. Your will is your problem. Stand to your feet all over this building today. <sighs> Father, I'm asking you now in Jesus' name, as the message has been preached under the anointing of the Spirit of God, I felt it, the people felt it tonight.
God, we were flowing together. I felt it while I was preaching. There was a flow of the Spirit tonight. There is an anointing here tonight. Your presence is strong and thick in this place. And God, tonight I can't help anybody that's not here tonight. Anybody whose will wouldn't allow them to come tonight, I can't help them, God. But God, through the message and preaching of this word, I believe every person in this place that will just align their will up with yours can be helped tonight. Every need can be met tonight. I believe tonight in the name of Jesus that miracles can take place. And God, I pray and ask you to do what you've done before. Not only what I've seen with my eyes that you've done, but what your word says on more than one occasion. That, and all of them were healed. I'm asking you to do that tonight for all that will believe you for it. God, tonight I'm asking I'm not wanting anything forced. I'm not pushing anything tonight. We're not going to, we're not going to push an agenda. God, tonight we're not going to violate people's will. Lord, tonight I just simply want your healing anointing to flow. I want it to flow. I want it to flow so easily tonight. God, I want bodies to just be immediately healed like we read about in our text. I want bodies to be miraculously touched by the power of God. I want healings to take place, that your name would be glorified in this place. God, that your people would be free of pain and free of bondage tonight in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. God, help us to tear down the towers we've built. God, help us not to put our faith in technology. God, but help us to humble ourselves before you and, re and, and confess that we need you tonight, oh God. We need you tonight. I'm asking right now for the healing anointing to begin to flow in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Just begin to touch your people. Begin to touch them. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I feel like there may be a couple people here tonight that you felt like God maybe healed you even while I was preaching. Nobody touched you. Nobody prayed for you. You actually felt like healing came upon you. I don't know if you felt something. I don't know if you had confirmation. I don't know if God told you. I don't know if you felt the heat of healing flood your body. I don't know. But you know, you're sitting there. There's a couple people that you would say, yes, I feel that. I just need you right now. You've already been healed. Now I need you to just take your mat and I want you to walk right up here as a testimony of what God's already done for you. Just get out from where you're standing and just come. I want you to be the first today. You already feel like God's touched you. Yeah, just come and stand today. Everybody else, just begin to give God praise. Put your hands together and praise Him. God's already touched people. He's already healing people. He's already delivering people. Glorify His name. Glorify His name. Kathy, do you feel God touched you already? Nobody laid hands on you, just the Lord touched you right here in this place tonight. Did you have pain in your body or something that went away or do you just, what do you feel tonight? The Lord just spoke to me, just said, I'm, I'm healing you right now, Kathy. Amen. Yeah. And you received it by faith. Voice that spoke to me, yes. The Lord spoke to you and said, I'm healing you, Kathy. Glory to God. What, what, what about you? Did you have pain or anything? What, tell, tell me about it. I have pain on the side of my leg completely, and um, I just felt like it was really warm. This is what you've been battling for several days, and you've been waiting for that. You told me about this yesterday. Now I remember, yes. You said, I've been waiting for Sunday night. So you've been having pain down your right leg, and what happened? A warmth come on you? It's just really warm, really hot on my leg, and the pain was gone. <laughs> the pain was gone. The pain is gone. I want you to pick that leg up. Move it. Move it like you couldn't move before. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. What happened in you tonight? Well, it's burning throughout my body right now. He is healing me through and through. <laughs> and you say you feel this burning. You know, so many people feel a heat when the healing power comes on them. Head yeah. right now. It's head to toe. I can feel it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody praise them tonight. Hallelujah. Praise them tonight. Hallelujah. In the name of Mashataki Son, no, 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 Matahai. What happened, Jamie? <laughs> I got butterflies on. <laughs> Were you in any pain? Oh, yeah, my wrist. You've been having a lot of pain in your wrist, that's right. Facing surgery, unless the great surgeon heals you. <laughs> Is the pain gone? Yes, I don't feel anything. I want you to move it around, make sure. Because if it's not all the way gone, we want God to finish it. Yes. 
<laughs> yes. I have arthritis. I used to have arthritis and this hand is gone. Can you shake it? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Touch her in Jesus' name. Touch her in Jesus' name. Touch her in the name of the Lord. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Don't tell me you saw me push her down. I just touched. The Lord did the work. The Lord did the work. Hallelujah. Next group of people, you're here tonight. And you did come expecting a healing tonight. I mean, you, you heard about the message and you said, you know what, whether it's you read it in the me email or you heard it this morning, I'm believing God going to heal me tonight. You, you, you didn't second guess it. I want you to come and try to stand around these people. Just watch where you're walking and come. Come with your hands up all over this building. And if you're here tonight and you'd say, you know what, I didn't really come expecting, but that word changed something in me tonight. It turned, the, the, I mean, something came alive in me. I want you to come and join them tonight. Everybody else, just pray. Come on. There's a sweet anointing here, and I don't want us to lose it by, by not being careful. Let's not lose it. Let's be careful tonight. Let's be careful tonight. Let's not sing. Just what you're doing is perfect. It's just perfect. Oh, thank you.